praise the Lord. This is Reverend Nessie coming at you on the 8th of December, 2011. And I believe in my heart that God has a word for us. Amen. Turning my phone off because every time I get started, somebody's going to call. Uh, and the, the word that I've been getting, the Lord's been really showing me something. He's been laying something on my heart. And um, so... I sat down today and did some research, some study. God's been laying on my heart about the Church of Laodicea. You may have heard the uh, seven churches in the book of Revelations. And every time I looked in the Bible, every scripture that I read, I read that the Lord gave me, it led to Laodicea. I believe I was in Acts at first. I can't remember exactly how I got started on this study. But uh, I think it was in Hebrews or Acts. And I was reading about the church of uh, Laodicea. So I said, well, let me go back to Revelations 2, two and 3. The seven churches that uh, Jesus addresses. There's seven different types of situations in the churches that he wrote to. So when you, and Laodicea is in the third chapter of Revelations, and it reads like this. It says, And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea, of the Laodiceans, write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. These are the words of Jesus to the Laodiceans. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, yes, Lord, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And knowest not thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou may see. And Jesus goes on to say, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come unto him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Notice as I read that, hopefully you read it with me, Revelation 3. Um, as I read that, we can see that Jesus is giving the Laodicean church time to repent. He's telling you, but quickly. He's telling you in verse 19, be zealous, therefore, and repent. In other words, he's saying, hurry up and repent. Do it now. Jesus is, I believe Jesus is telling us this today. I believe that we are in the Laodicean stage. If you, if you notice the way some churches are in the world nowadays, you can pick out those that are really on fire for the Lord. You can pick out the preachers. You can pick out certain churches like you see on TV or something. You can tell when somebody is serious and they're on fire for the Lord. They don't have to preach hell and damnation, you know, rain pour down upon... Not that kind of a preacher, but the type of preacher that goes by the Word of God. And you can also tell 
the preachers that are playing around with the Word of God. And they are uh, thinning the Word out. They're using God to their own, uh, however they want to use it, to their own good. Not for the good of the kingdom of God, but for their own good. There are preachers out there preaching happy, happy, happy. Everything's so joyous and happy. Just be happy. Jesus wasn't happy all the time. <laughs> no, nah, that brother, he wasn't happy all the time. Jesus had righteous indignation, and he exercised it on people at times as well. No, that's not what the word, the word doesn't say be happy, happy, happy all the time. God says do his will, and you will see the new heaven and the new earth. And you'll be so blessed. You have need of nothing. Yeah, like I say, God is living in us. We are the new ark. Notice what Jesus said. What was that? He said, I in his throne. Verse 21. Jesus said, to him that overcometh. Listen, he's talking to us. When you overcome this world, don't conform. Don't agree with the world. Don't try to be like the world. When you overcome the world, he said, I will grant you to sit with Jesus in my throne, in his throne, he says, even as I overcame and am set down with my father in, in his throne. In his throne. Try in God. Three in one. And for those that don't understand that, you know, we try to explain it the best that we can, but these are just one of those things. <laughs> We're going to have to wait till we get there for God to explain it to us. I mean, the Bible even tells you, you're not going to know everything. You know? Wait till we get there, and God will explain it to us. You'll see it. You'll see how it goes. You will understand how it goes. Amen. And there are some people who passed away and came back and saw it, and came back and tried to tell it the best that they could. The three in one God, triune God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Abba, the Father, Yeshua, or Yeshua, Jesus, the Son, and Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, our teacher. Amen. Um, Laodicea had a problem with boasting. As I read this, you know, as you read up on this in, in, in three uh, Revelation 3, they seem to have a problem with boasting. They say they're a rich church. They have no need of anything. Um, and there are some churches like that today, in our day, who act like they... They're all that in a bag of chips. They don't need anything from anybody. We're, all, we're doing our own thing. We don't need our brothers and sisters to help us. We don't need you. There are churches like that. There are churches uh, right now who operate on stuff. How much stuff they have. You know? Our church is pretty. Our church is is one of the most beautiful churches in the world. We're full of people. Everybody comes to us. You know, we are the church. Um, and little do they know, Jesus calls them lukewarm. And he says, wow, I really wish you was hot for me, or cold against me. He said, because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And I don't want to be one of the ones that Jesus spits out of his mouth. These uh, lukewarm, boasting, uh, self-satisfied churches, they say that they're rich. God says they're poor. They say they have everything that they need. We don't need help from anybody. In fact, we help other people. And God said, you're poor. He's speaking. See, they're, where they're speaking in the flesh, fleshly, worldly, God speaking in the spirit. And the spirit, more important than the world. You know, uh, we help people, we feed people, we do this and we do that, and I, 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 we put coats 
emphasis on children, we, 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 you know, um, and, and at the same time, when you're listening to them, they give no glory to God. There's some of them do it, no glory to God. They give glory to themselves, but they don't give God the glory. Um, they say they have no needs. God said they're half-hearted, backsliding. Well, what the, he calls them, back, they're backsliders because they turned their back on God. I'm sure you've heard it in the Bible where God says, you, at one of these, I believe it's one of the churches, he said, you, you left your first love. Amen. There it is. It's the first one. In chapter 2, uh, the Revelations 2, he's talking to Ephesus, which was, uh, 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 see, another rich city. Ephesus was a very, very rich city. They had everything. And they were self-satisfied. But he told them, he said, you, you left, in verse 4, Revelations 2, 4, he said, Nevertheless, have I somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. And when churches begin to become self-satisfied, when churches begin to boast about what they're doing, look what we have. You know, we have uh, two or three buildings, and we have playgrounds, and we have this, and we have that. They're just boasting about everything that they have. And they don't show you how it's affecting the kingdom. It's just what we have. Then they're not doing this. Not they're not about kingdom business. They're about their business. They want to look rich. They want to look better than the next guy. Keeping up with the Joneses. One guy gets a new church. The other one wants a new church. If you're not doing so good in the old church, <laughs> what makes you think God's gonna give you a new church? Amen. If you're not. It, look, if your tree is not growing any fruit in the old church, okay, and if you keep getting people to sign the roster, putting their names on a roster, but they're not coming to hear the word of God unless it's Christmas or Easter, something's wrong. A dead church, no matter how high the numbers are, is a dead church. Amen. If you're preaching the word of God the way it's supposed to be preached, and I hope a lot of you, I, I know you're going to agree with me on this one. If you're preaching the word of God the way it's supposed to be preached, the way Jesus preached it, people will come. God says his word will not come back void. People will come to hear the word of God. They will hunger to hear that word come forth. They won't wait till Christmas or Easter. Now, how many churches right now, how many can, can admit that? You know? I think it's a shame that people just come to church because it's a holiday. Something's wrong with that. Yeah, preachers might not want to admit that, but something's wrong with that. If they don't come to you, why don't you go to them? Amen. Half-hearted. Lukewarm. Self-satisfied. Satisfied with what they have. Don't care if they get more or not. You know, the Bible says that the apostles, uh, God went with them after they spoke in tongues, flaming flaming uh, tongues of fire of Holy Ghost. Is that God added daily such as should be saved. That means every city they moved to, they got bigger and bigger and bigger. God added daily. Not weekly, not monthly, not communion Sunday. Not just Sunday. Amen? God added daily such as should be saved. Not on Christmas. Not Easter. Amen? Not just. And spiritual poverty. Unclothed. Unclothed. God says they're naked. In verse 17. Unclothed. When you are naked and when you are unclothed, that means that you show, you have shame. You show shame. Just like Adam and Eve. What happened to them whenever their eyes were opened and then the Bible says they realized that they were naked? Um, for God to realize that Laodicea, the Laodicean church was naked, but for them not to realize... Wait a minute, okay? For, for, for a church to not realize that she's naked 
means to me that they show no shame. That'll preach at the word. When you see these churches nowadays that do things that are just extremely questionable, but yet they don't question it, they're naked. They show no shame. That can go on. I can think of a million examples on that one. They show no, they think they're all that. And they show no shame. And he, and he says they're blind. To be blind is not to be able to see God speaking in the spirit. They're spiritually blind. When you are cut off from the wisdom of God, one or two things happen. Actually, one thing happened. You stopped asking. Because God says in the Bible, ask. Ask. Ask for wisdom, and I'll give it to you. So, in order, in order for, for a church, an entire body of people, in order for them to be spiritually blind, they stopped asking God. You know, the Bible says, if you read up on David, early in the Bible, everything David, well, not everything. Notice his sins, he didn't ask God. He didn't inquire of the Lord when he was sinning. But when David did things, besides his sins that he, he did with Bathsheba and different sins he did, counting, numbering the people, uh, when David sinned, he, I mean, when David, anything David did, he inquired of the Lord. The Bible says, and David inquired of the Lord, and David inquired of the Lord. So for this church to be spiritually blind and naked, they're not asking God. You know, that reminds me of the preachers uh, that, uh, not to knock them, but just I've seen some things and heard some things and some tried and didn't work. Amen, personally. You know, but you know, when I do um, sermons, I try to make sure, and, and, it's one, and I, I don't like to do too many old sermons. I think I've done maybe, not, I'm not bragging, I'm just saying personally, I've, I've done maybe, throughout the years, four or five repetitive sermons. And that's because God showed me that something that I spoke in 2004 needed to be spoken over again to these certain people in 2010. You know, but I, when I do sermons, I write them down. You see me? When I'm, when I'm talking, I have my little, I go to the dollar store, get my little dollar uh, notebook. I, I write, I have books like the Apostle Paul did. He, he told somebody, make sure you bring my books with you. That's, hey, sister girl got her books. I write what the Spirit of God shows me in my heart. Not from what I know from my own mind. I write what God shows me in my heart. I like a fresh word. There's nothing. You can tell when you're listening to a fresh word. Amen. And um, I think of the preachers that keep preaching the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over. And, over. and it never stops. It never stops. It's always the same. You never get a fresh word. You have the same sisters in the church passing out and fainting and, and fanning themselves. You have the same brothers in the church with their eyes wide, you know. It's the same people. It's like um, hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, another word for that is acting, play acting. That's where actor and actress comes from, the word hypocritic, hypocrisy. They're play acting. It's emotional. You know, every time somebody says, and joy cometh in the morning, you know, and, you, and then the same people are like, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, you know, that, that's play acting. You know, he knows how to press their buttons. You know, she knows what will get them to act out. You know, but we know joy cometh in the morning, you know, but what is God saying to us for today? In the church service, this Sunday, Saturday, whatever day you go. You know, some preachers have learned how to press your buttons. 
and you know that you're listening to the same thing over and over and over and over, but you're still falling for the same lines. I say get off of the Similac and move on to the meat. People need to stop drinking the milk and learn how to move on to the meat. You're spiritually immature. And a lot of preachers know that. You know, some preachers keep their, their people spiritually immature. They're blind. The people are blind. I, 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 I've seen where the preachers in the church and the ministers in the church, they hear from God and they learn things but won't teach the church. They won't pass it on. They won't teach the church. So here... The head of the church knows a lot and have studied and learned a lot. But the body of church, what does the body of the church know? The only thing the body of the church knows is to love one another as God, is, is you want people to love you, treat people the way you, the golden rule, and tithing. <laughs> Amen? Speaking of which, I'm not knocking tithing because I've got blessed before, and I believe it's because I, I tithe. But I also got blessed when I didn't tithe. Um, I believe in my heart that the new covenant of God did not change God's law, which is the Ten Commandments, but everything else changed. Jesus changed, and you can eat uh, crawfish now, okay? You can eat shrimp. Uh, you can eat, uh, it depends. You can eat whatever you want to eat now. There's no more law about mixing milk and, what is it, they used to get like milk and meat to mix together or seafood or whatever and milk, I don't know. But, yes, Abraham tithed. And yes, it's in Malachi. But after Malachi, which is the Old Testament, comes the New Testament. New dispensation, which begins with Matthew, um, where the birth of Jesus. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is back in the older days, back in the Old Testament, God rode an ark, a man made ark four handles on it. Two on one side, two on the other side. And he rode in that ark. Had the angels with the wings touching and he sat on a mercy seat. He rode in it. But today, new dispensation, New Testament, God rides in you. He rides in us. And this is what I'm trying to say about tithing. Yeah, if anybody feels different, you know, let me know. Uh, I've had people yell at me for years about things that I said and did online that probably happened, you know. Um, you want to keep the conversation going? Just write me a note, you know. But we are now the new ark. God rides in you. He rides in us. We are the new ark. Here's my point. If you disagree with let me know. God rides in us. Jesus even said, the Father and I are one. And when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, the Father and I, the Father and us, are one. So, you're the new, you're the new ark. God rides in you. I can understand donations and alms and uh, giving but I really don't think that you necessarily have to tithe. It's good to tithe. When you give your tithes, you're helping out the church, keep the electric, gas, and water on. You're helping them to buy ink for their computers and Bibles to send to other countries. Now, I do believe that. But I don't believe you're going to get sent to hell for not tithing. The reason I say that is because if you are the new ark and God rides in us, he rides in us now, he rides in you, Saying that tithing is necessary is saying that 
you don't believe that the God in you can give you whatever you need. You know, people say, I tithe and I got a new car. I tithe and I got a new apartment. I know tithing works because I tithe and my son raised up off of his sick bed. So, are we saying that we have to tithe for these miracles to happen? If God is riding in us, shouldn't they happen with or without the money? So, are we saying that God is a slot machine and we have to put a hundred dollar bill in him and pull the lever to get our miracle? No. God is an all-seeing, omniscient, omnipotent, wonderful God. And nobody in the world is going to tell me that God needs our money. I believe the non-tither gets blessed as well as the tither. Now, I did hear that uh, Malachi, according to, uh, I don't know if it's old Hebrew fables or what, uh, or study, you know, but Malachi, some say Malachi was originally the beginning of the New Testament. I don't know, but all I want to say is, Nobody in the world is going to tell me that the God in me that rides in here in my heart cannot bless me with or without money. No. Uh, the, the, we're studying about Laodicea right now. Laodicea had all the money in the world. They were doing good. Self-satisfied. But look what God, gee, hallelujah, look what God told them. Hallelujah. God told him, he said, you say you're rich and you have no need of anything. See? You tithe and you have no need of anything. But God says, you're lukewarm. Your relationship with me has, has fa is failing. And I'm going to spit you out if you don't repent, if you don't stop. So these people who tithe, that think they're better than those who don't, they better stop. Because God's not about money. It needs to stop. We need to go back to our first love, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, these people were spiritually destitute. And no prophets, no signs, no vision, just church. <laughs> and, and how many times... How many churches do we see nowadays that have people throwing away canes and wheelchairs? There are some. There, there are some, but very few. You know, there are so many people that have the building, and they have the pretty doors in the front of the building, and they have the parking lot over here, and they have a little playground over there, and they have their little 300 members, or maybe 60 or 30 members or whatever, and they say their prayers, and they sing their songs, they have the choir sing, now we're going to take up the offering, and now we're going to hear the word, ten minutes, no more, no more. <laughs> so much formalism. You know, they have their, uh, their soup kitchen, some of them maybe, or whatever, but what's their relationship really like with God? Dried up? No signs? You can, go, you, ever, you can go into a church nowadays and come out feeling the same way you did if you went into a club. You hear music, you know. <laughs> hear, some, hear, hear a few words. Come out and go back in your car. You know. Where's the signs? Where's the sign that God dwells in your church? Where is the lady that stood up with the, with the eight kids and said, you know, the Lord cut my electric on. Or the Lord sent me a check I wasn't expecting. And I got my gas and water on. Where's the man that stands up and testifies about how his son got free college? And he doesn't know how. He just prayed to the Lord. And all of a sudden, his son's college is paid for. Where are the people who uh, the doctor says, cancer's gone. We don't know what happened, but we checked and double checked. Your cancer's gone. You hear of it sometimes on TV by certain people, but shouldn't this be happening in the Christian world every day? 
all the time, daily, such as should be saved. So is God so weak that he can't heal daily? Amen. And going through there's no good counsel, no, no good counsel. Going through spiritual famine. There's no word. Like I said, same word over and over and over and over again. You got people, you have people who go by a pod. You got your apostles, your pastors, your preachers, your teachers, and your evangelists. You got them in a church. But there's no vision, no sign. They keep getting ordained and, 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 and anointed for higher and new titles, higher and newer titles. And I'm thinking to myself, how many times do you have to get anointed to preach the word? I mean, it's like it's like being in the military. <laughs> they get anointed because they're P, they're they're what is a private? Then they get anointed because they're a PFC. Then they get anointed because they're a lance corporal. Then they get anointed because they're a corporal. Then they get anointed because they even it's like when does it stop? Just preach the word. Preach it in season and out of season. Amen. It's like, what is going to be your title tomorrow? Do, does everybody have to give an envelope full of money because you decided you're going to get a new title? I mean, we need to stop, guys. We need to stop. It needs to stop. And meanwhile, they're going up the ladder getting all these titles and getting all this money and getting anointed and having all these parties and buying all this cake and stuff and everything because they think so. They just think they're all that in a bag of chips. They're a self-satisfied church. See? Lukewarm. And meanwhile, nobody in their congregation is blessed. There's no new blessings. Some old blessings. But where's the new blessings? Show me a church that has 85% married couples because the pastor knows how to counsel. Oh, Jesus. Show me a church where the teenagers are knocking people's socks off by laying their hands on them. The teenagers are laying their hands on people, and people fall out and wake up blessed. And, and, their, and their sicknesses and illnesses, diabetes, is gone. Hey Amen. Show me a church where the kids can recite songs, David's songs, better than they can recite Jay-Z. Jesus. Spiritual famine. Laodicea. Self-preserved. No prophets, no signs, no vision. God's laws are avoided. No good counsel. No original true word. I'll leave you with this. Thinning down of the word. This is what's happening. The thinning down of God's word. What happens when water is at a slow trickle or stopped? The vessel that it was trickling in or running in dries up. Cracks up and breaks sometimes, just like the earth. Dry, crackled earth. It dries up. The Bible speaks of the washing of the word. Our minds and our hearts are clean, re-energized, renewed by the washing of the word. Not the trickling of the word. The washing of the word. Washing is a verb. It's an action. There has to be energy. God is a strong energy. It's these, you know, the, the energy that he has that he gives us is, is positive, good, healing, strong energy. Jesus, hallelujah. The harvest is dying, folks. I feel that, I believe that in my heart, God is saying, I don't know how long, how many years, I don't know. That's his business. I don't know. He's not giving me a year. I'm not going to be like the Mayans and say the world's going to end in 2012. They were intelligent people, but they made a mistake when they put a time on it. That's where they made a mistake. I do believe the Mayans are, are, are intelligent people. 
but I'm not going to put a date on it. But God is telling us that the harvest is dying. You know, everybody says that the fields are ripe, but the laborers are few. Guess what, folks? I'm going to change that up a little bit today, and I'm going to tell you. The harvest is dying. While we are looking for bigger churches and prettier cars. And writing down how many people come to our soup kitchens so that we can continue to get our government support. There's a wrong message being taught. There's a There's a wrong message being taught. And folks, we better get right. We have to have a godly mentality because Jesus is in us. Reverend Essie signing off. I hope you got a good word out of this. And like I said, please leave a message. I won't yell. I'm approachable. I promise. <laughs> God bless you. I love you. But remember, God loves you more. Amen.